uh, to Stephen Shaviro's public lecture, Whitehead Speculative Realism, Whitehead and Speculative Realism. Sorry. So before I introduce Professor Shaviro, I would like to express on behalf of the Eco-Materialisms Collective gratitude to the following contributors who made this event possible. The Departments of Comparative Literature, English, Spanish and Portuguese, Visual Studies and Classics, the Critical Theory Emphasis in the Humanities Commons at UC Irvine, and the Journal of Postmodern Culture. There's a lot of sponsors. I would also like to thank my fellow graduate students, whose diligence, patience, and good natures cannot be overstated. Anna Baginski, Michael Berlin, Danilo Cucudo, Manuel Del Alto, Finley Freibert, Christina Garcia, Aaron Guerrero, Crystal Hickerson, Daniela McKaney, Sean Patel, and Jessica Ziegelpus. Our wonderful <laughs> staff, uh, Bindia Baliga, Suzanne Golding, Liz Sanchez, and finally to our faculty advisor, Professor Gabby Schwab. Professor Stephen Shaviro is DeRoy Professor of English at Wayne State University and author of over 70 articles, both academic and literary, and seven books. His books include, and this is a list, 1993's The Cinematic Body, 1997's Doom Patrol, a theoretical fiction about postmodernism, 2003's Connected, or What It Means to Live in a Network Society, 2009's Without Criteria, Kant, Whitehead, Deleuze, and Aesthetics, 2010's Post-Cinematic Affect, and his most recent publication in 2014, The Universe of Things on Speculative Realism. In addition to Prof Professor Shaviro's prolific formal publications, he is author of the blog The Pinocchio Theory, which he has consistently updated since 2002. Alexander Galloway, uh, who will be delivering the keynote at this year's Comparative Literature Graduate Conference in March, has said that with the universe of things, Stephen Shaviro confirms his status as one of the most interesting speculative realist authors, and that in a philosophical field littered with mines and booby traps, characterized by antagonisms and growing factionalism, Shaviro managed to produce a very lively book filled with equitable and generous readings of the field. Graham Harmon, one of the original thinkers in speculative realism, has said of Shaviro that he's long been the most dignified and helpful of speculative realism's critics. The UC Irvine Eco-Materialisms Collective is a graduate student organized research group operating for the 2014 to 2015 academic year. The graduate and faculty members of the MC represent nine departments across the School of Humanities, Social Sciences, and Arts. In our research together, we have been conducting an interdisciplinary engagement with the fields of eco-criticism, critical environmental studies, and the so-called new materialisms. Our collaborations have been exciting, our disciplinary backgrounds meeting not so much in shared theoretical commitments, but in what I would call, what I could only call a certain style of thinking, a style marked by experimentation, collaboration, and an affirmation of the risk that such work entails. In the universe of things, Shaviro writes, quote, the concepts that a philosopher produces depend on the problems to which he or she is responding. Every thinker is motivated by the difficulties that cry out to him or to her, demanding a response. And so, without further ado, the EMC is excited to introduce a thinker whose work demonstrates a style of ex experimentation, collaboration, and risk, Dr. Stephen Shaviro. Okay. Thanks, James, and thank you, everybody, for coming here. Um, you don't know how, if you haven't spent winters in the upper Midwest, you, can't know how gratifying it is to be able to come out to Southern California in January. Um, so I've been enjoying the, I got here yesterday when I left my home in Detroit, it was 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's been very nice to be here for the short time that I'm here. Um, so I'm grateful to all of you for bringing me out, for coming to, hear, coming to hear me despite the competition, both of a lecture in robotics next door and, you know, the weather outside, which you may take for granted, which I don't take for granted in January. Um, so, okay, so um, what I'm gonna do here is a little maybe confusing to myself. Um, I have a talk, I don't really, I think it would be boring to read it verbatim. Um, I'll say the situation, I've been asked to talk about it quite a bit. I wrote a book on Alfred North Whitehead, and I most recently wrote a book about speculative realism, which I discussed this from our kind of Whitehead perspective, influence perspective. So what I'm partly doing is trying to give you a sense of an overview of the stuff I'm doing in the book. Um, but 
kind of writing about something you've already written about I find very boring, so I'm not very happy with what I wrote. So that's why what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut and paste and I'll read part of my prepared text, but I'll try to improvise a little, which may make it less fully coherent than it should be. And if I have time, I'll try not to talk more than 40 minutes or so, then 45 minutes at the most, then I'll go into a second essay, more recent, about Whitehead and about an underappreciated aspect of Whitehead's thought in relation to questions of causality. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to see how it goes. Okay, um, what else should I say? I should also say that I'm not a philosopher. Um, I, teach, I teach in a film studies program in an English department. And so, you know, while I'm always gratified if philosophers find what I'm saying to be worthwhile, I know a lot of people here aren't philosophers any more than I am, I still, you know, I'm worried about, you know, I, I think it's very, I think it's almost imperative to be interdisciplinary and to go and study fields which you might not know well enough besides the ones you're an expert in because I think the life of thought depends on that. At the same time, I think it's very dangerous because it's so easy to miss things which anybody in the, in the, in the field would find totally obvious. So I'm trying to skirt around that in, my, in what I say, and I hope you'll help you know, take account of that. Okay. So I also thought, um, to a certain extent, I should probably, I don't know to what extent people here know about either Whitehead or speculative realism, so I should probably say something about both of them in a more general introductory way as part of what I'm trying to do. Okay, so um, to begin, one way, and this fits in with a quote from my book which James ended his introduction me with, I think one way to think about philosophical programs, at least for me as somebody who's not really a philosopher, is to think about um, what kind of questions do they ask, what new things do they make it possible for us to think. I, 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 certain bodies of philosophy might be said, what they do is they come from a test. A test is asking a question in a different way, looking at something which might not have been looked at in the same way before, trying to draw a line um, in the sand, maybe, or maybe a more firm line around this question, and thus putting to the test what other people say and seeing whether they, what you can say comes, can, can still make sense. So what I'm going to do, I'll first say a little bit about speculative realism and introduce it sort of in those terms, and then I will, I'll t and then I'll talk about my work with Alfred Earth Whitehead and how I find his philosophy relevant to the questions asked by speculative realism. Okay, so I said if every philosophy, every worthwhile philosophy, sort of has a test. The test for speculative realism is the test of what. Kenton may assume one of the four full, I should say that speculative realism is a non-movement or a movement which isn't quite one. There was a conference at Goldsmiths in London in 2007 which was called speculative realism. It brought together four thinkers who were otherwise not necessarily connected. Um, they were one French thinker, Kenton may assume, one American, Graham Harmon, and two British philosophers, Ian Hamilton Grant and Ray Brassier. And the common rubric, speculative realism, was the thought that they were, although they came from very, very different points of view and had very, very different ideas, they were all addressing a question, and the question is what I'm calling a test. So the test of speculative realism asks really is, um, is there a possible way to think outside of and away from what Kenton may assume, one of these four original speculative realists calls correlationism? Mayasu defines correlationism as the thought that you can never talk about mind and the world separately from each other. They always have to be correlated with each other. What this means is that we can't talk about things in the world without our perspective on things in the world, without in fact acknowledging our perspective, which seems obvious and unsurpassable. And yet Mayasu wanted to say there was more to it than that. There's a certain sense in which we're missing a large part of the world for the universe, whatever you want to call it, because we only admit things from a human perspective. Um, and that's sort of, it's, let me start reading now and I'll come back to paraphrasing after all, okay. The great promise of speculative realism is that it promised, the great promise is that it promises, oops, I have to rewrite that, the great promise, I mean, sometimes you don't notice these things, is that it promises to break open the prison gates of our own all too human assumptions and to bring us into contact with what Kenton Mayasu calls the great outdoors. And this is a quote from Mayasu's book, After Finitude. 
the absolute outside of pre-critical thinkers. That outside, which was not relative to us, and which was given as indifferent to its own givenness to be what it is, existing in itself, regardless of whether we are thinking of it or not, that outside which thought could explore with the legitimate feeling of being on foreign territory, of being entirely elsewhere. Okay, that's a dense thing which needs some unpacking. Um, speculative realism endeavors to move beyond the framework of the merely human. It wants to get away from kind of anthropocentric habits of thought, even though because we're human beings, we can't avoid to some extent being anthropocentric. Yeah. Can you move the mic away? Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry, okay. Is this better? Yeah, okay. Um, as Eugene Thacker puts it, who was not one of the original four uh, speculative realist thinkers, but has joined their number. Eugene Thacker puts it, it's not enough just to consider the world in itself in contradistinction to the world for us. That just reproduces the old binaries of subject and object and of mind and matter. Mind, human culture, is the world for us, and, and the world in itself is what's left over from that, what's merely passive and inert and natural instead of cultural, whatever. I mean, there's a lot of people in the last 20, 30 years who wanted to question these binaries, not only the speculative realists, but also people, say, like Eugene, like Bruno Latour, who, if you look at his book, We Have Never Been Modern. Um, Thacker says, we must actively seek to approach the world without us, which he distinguishes from the world in itself. The world insofar it is not gi as it is not given to us, and that subsists following the subtraction of the human from the world. There's a certain sense that even when scientists look at the world as it is in itself, we're still looking at the world insofar as it exists for us, as it's oriented towards us. Um, Many philosophers, the most important philosophers for the last several hundred years, starting with Kant in the 18th century and notably including phenomenology in the 20th century, say in effect, as phenomenology says explicitly, the world is given to us. Um, what's given to us is something outside us. It's, we aren't, it's an anti solipsistic thought, but it's still, there's this, what Nesu calls a correlation. The world is given to us. We apprehend the world through its givenness, through the fact that through some act of primordial generosity, it's given to us, it's for us in a certain way, even though it's apart from us. And it's very hard to eliminate that aspect of putting ourselves in the center of the story. Um, the world that's not given to us is a very difficult thing to attain. It's not enough just to do experiments, though science is certainly a very big part of how we start to apprehend the world without us. But the world without us means the world subtracted from our presence and from our categories and the ways in which we mold it for ourselves. We must bring our own thought to the point where, where it is beside itself or outside itself. Um, speculative realism therefore asks us to displace ourselves so that we may encounter things that absolutely resist being cast in terms of our own habits, assumptions, and categories of thought. So the point is not just to talk about aspects of the world that don't include or that are beyond human beings, but to try to approach, is, is there a way to understand the world without having our categories of understanding being the net through which we understand the world? In a certain sense, it involves, involves a paradox. And I'll get back to this. Um, let me see. You see I'm kind of cutting and pasting, so well, let me go through this. I'll come back to it. Okay. Um, all four of the original speculative realist thinkers, Kenton Neasu, Ian Hamilton Grant, Graham Harmon, and Ray Brassier, Address this, try to address this basic situation of the world without us. A world that is not made in our image or to our measure. So if one of the oldest philosophical ideas is man is the measure of all things, which comes from the ancient Greeks, um, man or human, or admitting the English language gender reference, humanity or human beings are not the measure of all things. How can we think about things without thinking about them being, or ourselves as being the measure of all things? And all four of these speculative realist thinkers have a, you know, have a vision of the world, a metaphysical vision of the world, which displaces us from the center and which thinks in different ways. For Ian Hamilton Grant, even our most abstract theoretical thinking is still an expressive power of nature itself, on the same order as stellar fusion and planetary convulsions. Grant is a very difficult writer, but I think he's kind of wonderful because he comes up with these formulations. We should. We should think that our thought of the world is itself a force of nature in the same way that earthquakes are a force of nature. 
Um, and therefore, we should think that even our own thought is not something which really belongs to us or is really our own power, but something which goes back to something that exceeds us, which means that we're thinking things which we can't grasp in thought. Thought refers to something before it, which it cannot itself be comprehended by thought. There's always this excess, always this surplus beyond what is capable of being humanly graspable, even scientifically or cognitively in any sense graspable. For his part, Graham Harmon envisions a world of mysterious objects, none of which can be entirely plumbed by any other. Things continually beckon to one another from their depths, shining with an allure that cannot be cashed out in the form of knowledge or comprehension. For Harmon, we never can grasp anything else in its entirety, and what's interesting about things or objects is precisely this excess they have over our own attempts to formulate them or grasp them. So again, the problem becomes how do we grasp something that by definition exceeds our grasp. The other two put it in somewhat more rationalistic terms. Kenton may assume and insists on what he calls the ancestral, the traces of events anterior to the event of life as well as consciousness. These traces take no account of us. They cannot be regarded as phenomenologically given to us or existing for us in any way, shape, or form. In other words, um, Mesu is mocking the way in which, say, phenomenology in the 20th century all says that things, the data in the world exist for us. There's data transcend us, they're beyond us, things in the world are more than our fantasies about them, but nonetheless, it's for us, they're given to us. And Mesu says, how is the fossil of a dinosaur, or how is uh, the trace, the cosmic radiation trace of the Big Bang, how do they exist for us? They come from a world where there is no for us. I mean, we're saying, they exist for us, but he's saying this is a matter of talk which doesn't really work. They, they exist for us as being without us, but they don't really, he's saying that this ex existing for us runs into a paradox, that word of the world beyond us exceeds us in any possible way, any way we can grasp. Ray Brassier looks at the future, not the past. He reminds us that human thought, no matter how grandiose or transcendental it conceives itself to be, is nonetheless bound to physical embodiment and hence to mortality. It will someday come to an end, and I can't resist reading this paragraph out loud because it's so wonderful. Sooner or later, both life and mind will have to reckon with the disintegration of the ultimate horizon. When roughly one, when roughly 10 to the 17, 28 years from now, the accelerating expansion of the universe will have dis disintegrated the fabric of matter itself. Every star in the universe will have burnt out, plunging the cosmos into a state of absolute darkness and leaving behind nothing but spent husks of collapsed matter. All free matter, whether on planetary surfaces or in interstellar space, will have decayed, eradicating any remnants of life based in protons and chemistry, and erasing every vestige of sentience, irrespective of its physical basis. So this disintegration of matter itself is kind of, I mean, I can't, I have to say when I read this, I'm a lot reminded of the scene in, um, in Nicholas Ray's Rebel Without a Cause, where James Dean and his schoolmates go to the Griffith Planetarium in Los Angeles, and they hear a lecture about the infinitude of the cosmos and the utter pettiness and mortality of human concerns in comparison to it. It just exceeds any measure, and exceeds any measure of conceptualization. Um, the traditional response to such challenges has been to recuperate themselves reflexively, for I can think even my own inability to think. In this way, every failure operia becomes yet more evidence for the power of the mind, this is a move which goes back, like almost everything important in modern thought, really goes back to Kant. Kant describes the sublime and the critique of judgment as one of the, as a supreme aesthetic experience of the sublime. And uh, this is a quote from Kant. Bold overhanging as it were threatening cliffs, thunderclouds towering up into the heavens, bringing with them flashes of lightning and crashes of thunder, volcanoes with their all destroying violence, hurricanes with the devastation they leave behind, the boundless ocean set into a rage, a lofty waterfall and a mighty river, etc., make our capacity to resist into an insignificant trifle in comparison with their power. And this is the moment of sublime in Kant, when we feel utterly nature's excess just utterly crushes us. But Kant recuperates this very famously. Yet we're openly confirmed in our own self-consciousness by these confrontations, Kant says. Such sublime spectacles, another quote, elevate the strength of our soul above its usual level and allow us to discover within ourselves a capacity for resistance of quite another kind, which gives us the courage to measure ourselves against the apparent all-powerfulness of nature. And so Kant and the Kant's formulation of the sublime, which resonates through not only modern aesthetics, but I'd say also through modern epistemology, is that 
our capacity to imagine even our own annihilation, in effect, gives us an ability to transcend this <coughs> annihilation. Um, so this is really, this is something which gets played out again and again in Western thought since Kant, and it's what Mayasu is critiquing when he calls it the correlationist circle. Um, now, how does this work? I mean, from a, from a strictly logical point of view, the key correlationist assertion that I cannot think or speak of something without thereby turning it into a correlate of my thought is undoubtedly a sophism. So, I mean, it's sort of like, for, for Mayasu, this goes beyond, in the history of Western philosophy, it goes before Kant, it goes to George Berkeley, who basically says things only exist in the mind, because if you think of something, therefore you're thinking of it. If you stop thinking of it, in effect, Berkeley says, it'll cease to exist. And that's obviously absurd since we all assume that things will still exist even when we go to sleep, you know, or get knocked unconscious. But Barclay says God's thinking of things. In other words, things only exist as ideas, and without existing, they can't exist outside of existing as ideas. Now, in that form, it's obviously a sophism. It's obviously wrong. You can think of something as being independent of yourself. But the question is, how do we recuperate in our thought by saying we're thinking of it as being independent of us? We're still, it's like on a meta level. We can think of things that absolutely contradict our own existence. I can think of the world after I'm dead, but I am still have the power of thinking of the world after I'm dead, and that's still my, my power. So there's a kind of performative contradiction. I, if I talk about being dead, or I talk about the insignificance of my own point of view, I'm still expressing it from my own point of view. I'm saying one thing, performing something else. And this performative contradiction is sort of in, inescapable. Um, in other words, once I've accepted the phenomenological principle, I mean that and this, that all consciousness is conscious of something, I'm no longer able to separate things from my perception of them. I know that they exist beyond my perception of them, only perceiving them partially, and yet the way I address them means I'm trapped in thinking of them in terms of my own thinking of them. Okay, so that's sort of the dilemma to which speculative realism points. And all the speculative realists in their very different ways try to overcome this dilemma, understanding that it's a performative dilemma, that it's easy to refute correlationism, that things exist only as correlates of my thought of them. It's easy to refute it logically, but it's much more difficult to refute it performatively, since performatively, even if I say it's, even if it's a valid, I'm still, in effect, on a meta level, recuperating it in this kind of ultimately Kantian move. So that's why it's not just simple to say, well, I mean, it's one thing to say, of course, it's like in the 18th century, Barclay's idealism, Doc, Dr. Samuel Johnson <coughs> said it was ridiculous, which it was, um, and, Johnson, and Johnson claimed, I refuted thus, and he kicked a rock. And you know, his point was that my foot hurts when I kick the rock. The rock is solid, it's an obstruction, it's really there. And so it's ridiculous to say the rock is just an idea. Now, of course, Johnson is right and Barclay is wrong, but Johnson's <coughs> refutation doesn't really work because Barclay just used to say, well, that's, the pain is also your idea of your foot when it, after it hits the rock, it, it just moves it up to a metal level. It doesn't really um, contradict it or refute it at all. So it's harder, even though there's certain things which are totally ridiculous, but it's very hard to refute them to actually think of how you can do this. It leads to these strange mental contortions. And that's what speculative realism takes as its bread and butter. The realism part is the insistence the world exists apart from our conceptualizations of it. The speculative part is that we have to go through bizarre contortions of thought in order to get there, because by the very way in which we think about things, even if it's a sophism, we're still bringing them back to our conceptions of them. It's like, how can you transcend your own point of view, especially if you don't believe a universal view from nowhere is possible? What speculative reason is trying to do is say there's no universal view from nowhere possible, but there's also any perspective I have on things is necessarily too limited and wrong. How do you get away from both of those? It seems almost impossible. And the different speculative realists answer this in different sorts of ways. Some of them answer it in ways by turning to science or to mathematics. Um, Mayasu, I won't rehearse this whole argument here, but Mayasu basically argues um, that, argues, takes Kant's transcendental argument, turns it inside out, and argues that the one thing that is absolutely rational and logically necessary is that nothing be necessary, that everything is contingent. And therefore, he, he draws this as a principle that we can rationally know with absolute certainty, that everything is contingent, that the cause and effect and, and scientific laws and all these things have, you know, change. Anything can happen at any time for no particular reason. Now, I mean, again, we could have a whole talk about this. It's, it, it sounds just, again, speculative realists, I think they all 
traffic and things which sound like completely ridiculous if you just fit them as flat propositions, but would actually, when you see how they argue for them, there's something very beautiful and very powerful and compelling in their ideas. So if you want to dismiss them, as I very often do, you have to find a way to do it rather than just simply kicking the rock. Okay, so um, I don't want to summarize, again, it'll take too long to summarize all of them. But basically, Ray Brassier basically is interested in the demystifying power of science. And, you know, sort of, so it's a common narrative ever since Copernicus and then Galileo, that science, and then Darwin Moore, and then Freud claims to be the in science. The anthropomorph, you know, takes human pretensions away. We're not the center of the world. We're not the center. Things don't respond. We're not the center of the world. The world is not, the earth is not the center of the universe. Um, we, you know, then, and you get Galilean science, and then Newton, and these universal laws, and everything is mechanism, aside perhaps from mind. Then you get to Darwin, and you get, you know, we're evolved, we're animals, we're related to these other beings, we evolved from them, so human beings don't have any special privilege. Now, partly with Freud, but now more with cognitive science, we're learning more about our, our, where our minds work, and that our minds are material objects, and that they function in many ways which we're not aware of, and that our only perspective about who and what we are may well be dubious. And so Brassier sees um, this as a continual process of demystification, which science performs and which has to be pushed to an ultimate point, which is, the ultimate point is a kind of weird combination of nihilism and rationalism. The nihilism comes from the fact that all our self-congratulatory things about ourselves are fictions, which can be disqualified. The real rationalist part of the fact is that it's through the rational methods of science that we're able to be aware of this. And so anyway, that's, uh, that's one end. The other two, Grant and Harmon, have very different solutions. And their solutions, you might say, are more aesthetic instead of, si instead of rational or scientific. But once again, all f these thinkers are responding to this performative contradiction in trying to get away from anthropocentric or points of view. Um, Grant agrees with Brescia that our conceptions of things are always different from the things themselves. But he doesn't think that scientific representation can reduce this distinction the way Brassier does. Grant instead breaks down the very dichotomy between my limited correlational conceptions of things and the things themselves. For the things, the, my conceptions as well as things themselves are finite products of nature's own boundless productivity. Conceptions like objects are never adequate to the forces that impel them. But conceptions and objects alike are nonetheless products of these impelling forces. My very cognitive performance or conceptual production However inadequate and wrong it is, it's a self derived from the excess that it's unable to contain or represent. So Grant, Grant goes back to Kant's moment of the sublime and inverts it in a way that we don't have our mental power over it, but we, we recognize that we belong to it even as it exceeds us and crushes us. Um, Harmon does it somewhat differently. Harmon says, the real is something that cannot be known, only loved. We can never actually know things apart from our own frameworks. But we, we, what we can do is be always aware of the inadequacy of our own frameworks and find the kind of a weird aesthetic attraction of things to us as the point at which they are, they are beckoning to us from across a void which we can never cover. So Harmon says that we only have an indirect and elusive access to things, or objects as he prefers to say. We never know a thing in its entirely. We may not even know ourselves in its entirely insofar as we ourselves are, mis are equally mysterious things, mysterious entities. The universe is composed of these mysteries which can never be fully resolved because you can never get to the point of view of something else. We're always stuck within our own limited perspective and we can thrust beyond this more through aesthetic means than through cognitive or knowledge-based ones. Um, so in short, and I'm gonna cut this part short because I fear I should either take three times as long to explain it or, you know, I'm not going to because I want to get onto other things. But anyway, so speculative realism in these different ways, in very detailed ways, wants to think about the world apart from the way we impose our categories upon the world, realizes this involves a performative contradiction that even saying this, we're sort of doing the opposite, even saying we're getting away from this involves that we're doing what we're saying we're not doing anymore. That the only way to solve this is through very kinds of weird self-reflexive or self-deconstructive movements in which we have to both assert and discredit our assertions at the same time. And this leads us in a very strange place where even if science is justified as the descriptor of the world without us, it's still only a very strange way that we can access science and we can talk in the language of science. We conceptualize things, but things 
are non-conceptual. They never, no concept ever touches the thing of which it's a concept. And we, we have to use some kind of strange contortion of thought in order to get at that aspect of the real which we are, una we are unable to conceptualize. Okay, so that is the test which, the, the test which Stark Speculative Realism <coughs> proposes is this test of does it escape the correlational circle? And again, certain things, I mean, it's not always clear whether the test is passed. You might say that for Speculative Realist phenomenology fails this test. Um, Merleau-Ponty's very beautiful and very profound philosophy is all about the interchange between us and the world. There's, there's always these two poles from Merleau-Ponty. It's absurd to, to adopt a solipsism which would not acknowledge that the world transcends us, goes beyond us in all possible ways, but it's equally absurd to think that we can talk about the world without including our own experience of the world as, as the basis of, of this. So the two must always go together. This is precisely what may assume means by correlationism. So somebody like Merleau-Ponty and other phenomenologists would fail this test. They wouldn't be sufficiently realist. Even though Merleau-Ponty's whole philosophy is about how, yes, the physical world, the sensual world, the world exists, it extends far beyond my own body, which is itself part of the world, nonetheless it doesn't go far enough for speculative realism. Others are more ambiguous. The thought of Jacques Derrida, for instance, has been both praised as being speculative realist of the lettre and denounced as being another version of correlationism. Why does it mean to say that everything's a text? Does it mean to say that everything's put up in human webs of signification? Does it mean that, or is it another way of getting at the speculative real, realist point that conceptuality is always inadequate, that thing, there's always an excess over the ways in which things can be grasped and organized? We cannot stop organizing things and conceiving them, but we also have to accept their escape from this organization and conceptualism. So it's ambiguous whether Derrida passes or fails the test. And people have argued about this. The argument has particularly come up recently in, this, in Derrida's discussion of the animal and the question of whether he really gets to animals or, or whether it still remains in the human framework. Okay. Now, this brings me to Alfred North Whitehead. So Whitehead was philosopher, his dates are 1861 to 1947. He had different bodies of work. His early work was in mathematics, where he collaborated with his famous student Bertrand Russell. His later work, his metaphysical, is very different from that. It was made after he came to Harvard. He left Britain and came to Harvard in 1924, when he was in his 60s. Whitehead's main book is called Process and Reality. It was published in 1929. This had a subterranean presence in the history of philosophy. It's sort of been excluded both from most histories of both continental philosophy and analytic philosophy but it's had a summoning of a resurgence, which I'm certainly part of in the last 10 or 15 years. Now Whitehead, what, as I said, he started out as a mathematician. He later became interested in very unmathematical issues about aesthetics and ethics and lived experience. But he does it in a peculiar way. Whitehead's entry into, what, okay, I'll first say, Whitehead, I think, does pass the, correl the test of correlationism, the speculative realist test. He can be called a speculative realist avant la lettre because what Whitehead does is that he, does, he, he resists or rejects the attempt of most Western philosophy to base knowledge of the world on the epistemological relation between subject and object. Um, Whitehead insists that all entities in the world have to be seen on the same basis. So we cannot privilege, say, how a, a mind or a subjectivity or a self responds to the object world then without also thinking about how other things interact with each other. There's no privileging. Everything can be called a subject in some aspects of how it exists and an object in other aspects of how it exists, but there's no parceling out of roles. There, are no, there aren't two types of entities, one which is mental, one which is physical, one which is subject, and one which is object, and so on and so forth. In this sense, Whitehead de-anthropo-decenters de -anthropo philosophy in already in the 20s in the ways that um, speculative realists want to do today. But Whitehead's own concerns were actually very different. Um, Whitehead was concerned with, basically, Whitehead, he started as a mathematician, he then became interested in physics, and his main concern was with the revolution in physics of the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. In 1885 or so, physicists really felt that they had, they understood the laws of nature, they understood everything about how the world worked in, in grand principles, really just a matter of filling in the details. In the next 20 years, everything fell apart, and they realized that what they had taken for granted as basic principles were completely wrong. 
and, and, and physics had to be reconstructed on a new basis with relativity and quantum mechanics in the early 20th century, which even though at Newtonian, you know, Newtonian physics still works at our, at our speeds, but basically Newton's basic underlying assumptions were totally wrong. And still today, 100 years later, nobody really agrees because both relativity and quantum mechanics are so weird, nobody really agrees as to what it means, what the nature of the physical world really is. So Whitehead was concerned with the, he, he, he was excited by the way in which um, the new physics sort of dissipated some of the prejudices of like 18th and 19th century mechanistic thought. That aside from the human mind, the entire world was like a machine which just operated with complete regularity and complete predictability. At the same time, he was really worried about how what the physicists were discovering was so seemed so sharply incompatible with, with experience or everyday reality. And Whitehead's test for philosophy was to overcome what he called the bifurcation of nature, the division between sort of experiential, phenomenal experience and scientific physical explanation. <coughs> He defines the bifurcation of nature as the division between the nature apprehended in awareness, what we're aware of, and the nature which is the cause of this awareness. The nature which is in fact apprehended in awareness holds within it the greenness of the trees, the song of the birds, the warmth of the sun, the hardness of the chairs, and the feel of the velvet. The nature which is the cause of awareness is the conjectured system of molecules and electrons which so affects the mind as to produce the awareness of apparent nature. So, to gloss this, you might say that he's identifying the bifurcation nature. He's identifying that, I mean, this is the war of the cultures. You know, C.P. Snow in the 50s writes about the two cultures, the scientific culture and the humanist culture, and how they were irreconcilable and what emerges was. This is what Whitehead was concerned with in a very interesting way. The poet and the phenomenologist recognize only the nature which is, in fact, apprehended in awareness. That comes first. The scientist, on the other hand, sees this as mere illusion and instead only recognizes the nature which is the cause of awareness. So it's another example Whitehead gives is, do we experience the beauty of the sunset and the redness of the, of the sun tinging the clouds as it sets? Or do we experience the way photons are produced by nuclear reactions in the sun and stream, into, stream to the earth through space, enter, and enter our eyes, and then are tracked as nerve impulses work through our brain to give us this awareness? Um, if the phenomenologist says that the experiential thing is first because science is only an extension of the way we experience things. So even if science explains it differently, still we have to give priority to the phenomenal experience. And the scientist says, well, you know, a lot of these phenomenal experiences are just illusions. We can now explain scientifically how the illusions are caused. So basically what's reality is just, is, these, is this physical process. And our feeling of the beauty of the sunset is just a kind of projection. So Whitehead sees that as a division, and he doesn't, he wants what he wants, unlike Unlike the scientist, he's not satisfied with the second level, the second type of explanation. But unlike the phenomenologist, he doesn't want to displace that with the first type of explanation. He wants, is there a way to think of the world that you could hold both of these at the same time and not deprivilege either of them? And that's obviously a very different thing, since we have this split, we have these very different ways of understanding, of understanding things. So Whitehead's test really is is the theory in question, does it overcome the bifurcation of nature? Does it overcome this division between mere phenomenal appearance on the one hand and scientific underlying reality on the other hand? Is there a way that we can hold both together? And again, for Whitehead, something like phenomenology, which he wasn't very much aware of, though there were a few, there were, he had students who had also studied with Husserl in the 1920s, but basically they seemed to be happening separately. The phenomenal experience comes first. For the scientists, the physical explanation comes first. Very few people are willing to handle both. The relation of Whitehead to speculative realism, or the fact that he is willing to, that he can be seen in relation to them, comes to the fact that some of them, at least, pass the kind of test which he sets up between these two different ways of understanding the world or understanding nature. Um, some of the speculative realists don't pass <laughs> Whitehead's test. Kenton may assume, in after finitude, the very first page, he says, the first thing I want to do is restore Descartes' distinction between primary and secondary qualities. So the physical material presence of an object is real, but the fact that it's the color black is unreal. It's just a subjective projection. Things like color, sounds, and phenomenal experience are just secondary qualities, really just are additions to what really exists. 
and we have to separate what really exists from our additions to it. This is how Neasu seeks to overcome correlationism, and it's something which Whitehead, Whitehead's very beginning is to reject that approach. Whitehead rejects the approach, and Mayasu outrageously hyperbolizes it behind what anybody else had ever previously thought to make it. The other speculative realists, however, are more are, are, are more ambivalent. I think Harmon does pass um, Whitehead's test because he puts the two ways of thought on a parody and says they both represent the fact that we cannot actually grasp things in themselves in, in an absolute sense. Harmon actually has an article where he writes about Arthur Eddington, who was a scientist with philosophical interests in the early 20th century. He's one of the people who did empirical tests which validated the general theory of relativity by observing the transit of Mercury in front of the sun in 1920 or something like that. General relativity comes out in 1915. Eddington was also interested in the contrast between science and phenomenal experience. And he writes about the, their two tape in, in, in a famous popular observation book, he starts by talking about their two tables. We have this table here, we have the table of phenomenal experience, which is solid, which I can sit on, do all these things with. They also have the table as it's described by science, which is mostly empty space because it's composed of atoms which consist of, of nuclei with electrons circling about them and the, the, most of it is empty space, but it doesn't seem empty because of the repulsive electromagnetic charges, it feels solid to us. And he says, the problem is we have these two different images and we can't reconcile them. Harmon says, well, the problem is that both of these, in effect, both of these are true, but both of these are false. Both of these are reductions. The, the, the table as a thing in itself is neither what the scientists say nor what the poet says. It's neither our phenomenal experience nor the scientific description. It includes both of those, but it transcends, it goes beyond both of those. We cannot ever reach the table in itself. We cannot ever become the table. We're always separate from the table. We can grasp it in these various ways, but there's really a third table, irreducible to the other two, which we can never grasp and which we can only love, and that is, um, and that is what the reality of objects really is. And in that way, I think Harmon agrees with Whitehead, who he has very ambivalent relation to, and continues Whitehead's idea of, the bi of overcoming the bifurcation of nature. I think Ian Hamilton Grant, who I mentioned before, who always sees nature as transcending our ability to think it, but that thing, but rather than opposing our thought to, say, physical processes, we should think that both my thinking of the world and the volcano erupting are expressions of this kind of natural regenerative force which is always active and which is, is the driving, underlying driving force of reality. Um, therefore, again, there, there, there's not a problem between the two sides because they both have their place within this larger scheme. So, Mayasu, of, of the speculative realist, Mayasu fails Whitehead's test. Grant and Harmon pass it. Mayasu fails, they pass. Ray Brassier, the fourth one, is the one who has is most ambiguous in terms of, in a certain sense, Brassier is a hardcore advocate of the scientific reductionism, which would reject the first half, which would bifurcate nature and would denigrate the first half and only celebrate or only recognize the second half, the scientific side, not the poetic side. However, Brassier's scientism is not really simplistic. Um, he doesn't think we can do without the, the phenomenal or or the phenomenological or poetic side, even though he, even though he sort of runs it down and often criticizes it. Um, Brassier argue, Brassier again is throwing on the American analytic philosopher Wilfred Sellers, who kind of is a kind of 20th century rewriting of Kant, would be the best way to put it. Sellers distinguishes between two images of man, the manifest image, which is our own self-understanding, and the scientific image, which is what science reveals. We understand we have certain emotions and certain feelings and certain desires. Science looks at how our, neur our neurons operate and how all these forms of computation are going on unconsciously in our mind and projecting sort of very reductive reports of this, which is what our consciousness consists in. So, but Brassier's not saying we should get rid of this manifest image, this kind of common sense image, this folk image as is sometimes pejoratively called by philosophers, and only have this true scientific image. Because, he says, why would we want the scientific image if we didn't have this manifest image? In other words, Nietzsche says, well, you know, I mean, Brassier's engaging with Nietzsche, just to bring in yet another name, I'm sorry. Um, so Nietzsche says that basically everything we believe is an illusion which we're projecting, that reality doesn't correspond to our illusions. 
Therefore, we can never attain reality. This is very simplistic. And therefore, we should celebrate illusion, celebrate falsity, celebrate our own fantasies, in effect, or our own will to power. Brasco says, no, science actually does allow us to get overcome this kind of solipsistic trap, trap, trap of only thinking of things in our own framework. However, we never get there. It's an asymptotic process. We never, I mean, other trends in philosophy of science have also said this, but Brasco puts it in a new kind of context. So we know that we will eventually die, that eventually humanity will be exterminated, that eventually there will be no matter left in the universe because everything will be broken down into a soup of subatomic particles, um, that everything therefore is fighting and doomed to death, and that we're, you know, in effect, perhaps because we're already dead because this is the horizon of our, of our thought. And yet, Brassier says, nonetheless, we still retain the need to make this approach to this horrible disillusioning truth. We want to get closer to this disillusioning truth. We need to approach it. And that, to that extent, the first side of the bifurcation is not completely obliterated for Brassier. So I don't think Brassier likes Whitehead very much, and he wouldn't accept the part of the test that Brassier, that, that Whitehead proposes, but he, but he nonetheless isn't completely apart from it, because precisely because he's dealing with these questions, which I said, this performative contradiction of what it means to talk about the world apart from the way we think about the world, to think about the world apart from how we think about it, to undo our own thought of the world in order to grasp the world outside of our own thought, that the contradiction it necessarily involves. Um, to that extent, even though I, I would still drag him screaming and kicking back into the Whiteheadian framework, which he, he resists. Okay, I don't know, I mean, I, I didn't get to the second essay. I think at this point it would be too long, so maybe I should just stop there and ask for questions. I hope that made sense to people to some extent. <laughs> okay, questions? I know there was a lot of stuff and I le left out a lot so I wouldn't be speaking for like four hours. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if I could attempt to maybe vindicate uh, phenomenology for yeah. a moment, or at least maybe not Husserl's phenomenology, but Husserlian phenomenology. So sure. it seems insofar as you're talking about speculative realism, that presupposes being there dis this distinction between that which is conceivable and that which is metaphysically possible. So in analytic philosophy, you know, we have people like David Chalmers who yeah. champion this idea that that which is conceivable is ipso facto metaphysically possible, and similarly about inconceivable, inconceivability and impossibility. Yeah. That strikes me as being ridiculous, so I think you and I agree, agree about that. Yeah. But then I wonder from the perspective of Husserl, so Husserl gives us a formal ontology yeah. of categories that are supposed, supposed to apply to three different material ontological regions that mm -hmm. uses nature, spirit, and yeah. consciousness. Um, and it's a part of those formal categories that any time, for example, we think of a process necessarily that involves an object. Obviously, this is going to be completely different from what where yeah. right it goes. But I think there's a way of reading Husserl where, insofar as we're practicing phenomenology and using the met methods of phenomenology in the FOK, we have no alternative but to do this. But that doesn't seem to ipso facto close off the possibility of a speculative metaphysics, say, no, of the kind that, that Whitehead is doing. And just the final yeah. point, interestingly, if we look specifically at Husserl's analysis of time consciousness and how that develops from mm -hmm. 1909 onward, he ends up talking about this flow, and he says that even speaking about it in terms of a flow is itself uh, misleading or absurd, or it's a scandal that there is mm -hmm. such a flow because it's a process that's not supposed to have an object, and yet Husserl himself is speaking about it. Yeah. This resembles already the notion of becoming that Whitehead will develop later, which is not temporal. Mm -hmm. It's the ground of anything which is temporal. So I wonder if that's a way of possibly vindicating this. I, it, for me, it isn't a matter of, you know, in absolute terms. The, the problem is there's always a polemic here. I say that each philosophy offers a test, and you say some philosophies pass, other philosophies might pass the test, and some might fail the test. And it's pretty clear that, as, at least as Mayasu defines correlations, and that phenomenology in general is a prime example of what he's trying to get away from. That doesn't mean that there aren't other useful ways to work with a given author, or a given text, or a given body of thought. I mean, what I point to in this respect is the ways in which, of the four original speculative realists, Harman is the one who's really coming out of phenomenology and is 
grounding is between Husserl and Heidegger. And he refers to them all the time, but he's radically revising them. Um, you might think of also the way that Derrida's earliest philosophy is based on the kind of deconstruction of Husserl. And so, I mean, there's a polemical aspect to this which I don't think can be avoided. Um, there's in that, you know, they're going to sing to say, we have to stop thinking this way and think another way instead. And to a certain extent, you have to dramatize that to show what's new and what makes you think differently in a new body of thought. But at the same time, of course, there are many ways, I mean, well, any text which is really interesting and deep, you know, has many ambiguities. I mean, I myself find this with Kant. I'm always referring, in working on Whitehead and of the I'm always reverting back to Kant and seeing various dilemmas and various things going on in Kant that, you know, some people in, in, in the speculative rhythm groups really, you know, can't stand this. They say, you know, Kant's the enemy, Kant's the ultra-correlationist. And yeah, he is, but Kant's thought is where, um, is where all these contradictions come up, and you have to go over that territory to renegotiate it. So I'm not personally very drawn to Husserl, but that's just something about me, but I wouldn't disagree that these different texts are way, and I, I give Harman and Derrida as examples, are ways in which these questions could be run through. It just, it's really just a question of, again, which distinctions you want to draw and which texts you're going to make. I mean, it, there's always a kind of this, there's always this kind of thing, you know, well now, I mean, every philosopher from the ancient Greece to the present has declared, now everybody's been wrong until now, and now I've discovered the truth of everything. And obviously, you know, one way is to be cynical and say, you know, philosophy is all bullshit, we just forget about it. But if you, if you find it valuable anyway, then you have to, you know, find what elements you can work in. So that's my circumlocutious answer. I'm not particularly interested in working with Husserl, but if you are, that's fine, and I think there are things you can do. I mean, so that, that's the way I put it. I hope that seems an adequate answer. Yeah, way back there. Thank you for your talk. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The motif that kept repeating itself towards your talk was the locution passing a test or failing a test. Yeah. So if you could locate what the term means within your broader scheme of things, whether the scheme of things be ontological or epistemological. Yeah. Who is the examiner? Who is the examinee? And what is a test without some imprimatur of some kind or another? Yeah. And what normativity is intended here, either as a cogito pine or a primordial test? So I would like you to say more about the whole modality of something. So yeah. Is nature testing us? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I suppose, I suppose it is. I mean, in a Darwinian sense, we're being tested, you know, on whether we survive or get killed. I mean, you know, um, in in specific philosophical terms, I mean, it is a gesture, as I said, of separation, of saying we go this way, we don't go that way, and you sort of, I don't know, is it white? I didn't say as much as I could have what Whitehead, um, Isabel Stenger, the Belgian philosopher, wrote a very important book on Whitehead thinking with Whitehead, and she, she tries to characterize Whitehead's thought, and she has a lot of you know, various ways of saying it. So one way she characterizes Whitehead's, Whitehead's thought is as follows. It's, it's an old um, Hasidic story about a student comes to a rabbi and says, oh, rabbi, I don't know what to think. Rabbi A says that blah, 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 blah. And the rabbi, oh, rabbi says, yes, he has a point. And then the student says, but Rabbi B says it's the opposite. He says, da, 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 da. And the rabbi says, yes, he has a point. And then the student says, but Rabbi, Rabbi A and Rabbi B can't both be correct. And the rabbi says, yes, you have a point. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, I think the point of the story is that there's, there's, there's some way where you, you have to make the decision between A and B. There are other times where you want to be able to have that suspension where you entertain both of them. And the test pertains to when you want to make, when you have to, you're back to the one you have to make a distinction, but it may be a good idea to postpone that as long as possible. I don't know if that answers, but yeah. Uh, okay, let, let me start maybe by pulling your leg a little bit. Um, I thought Samuel Johnson uh, kicked a, a chair or a table. I thought it was a rock. Not but a rock. Can anybody... I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, think it's I'm not sure either. I'm not an 18th century expert. Because it's London yeah. and the coffee houses or yeah. so. mm -hmm. <laughs> well, nature. Anyway, uh, the, I think it was a uh, pebble, a rock in the street, not in nature. <laughs> so in the street, yeah, the coffee right. So I have two sets of points, uh, yeah. slightly more, less facetious anyway. So the first set concerns um, Whitehead and Wordsworth and linking that to um, Mala May and Mayosur. Mm -hmm. 
Because mm -hmm. the, um, yeah. for example, um, you know, Whitehead is, is, as we all know, uh, said things like, uh, uh, you know, outside of uh, actual objects, there is nothing, right? Uh, outside of things, mm -hmm. there yeah. is nothing. And um, Wordsworth, I mean, the, the thing is, you know, Whitehead's uh, organicism doesn't make him uh, a tree-hugging uh, philosopher, right? No, does it know it's Wordsworth uh, that. But you see, if you link this to, for example, <laughs> these lines in, in Wordsworth, like in, in his poetry, right? The whole, the whole uh, uh, implication of nothing mm -hmm. in, in all these things, right? Yeah. Whitehead's nothing, and Wordsworth, and, and you know, of course, that Whitehead was a passionate reader of, mm -hmm. uh, of Wordsworth. But when Wordsworth says, you know, nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of mm -hmm. glory in the flower. Right? Now, yeah. the, I mean, the interesting thing about this nothing is that it's as if the nothing has an agency, mm -hmm. right? It is, in fact, the nothing that brings back splendor. I mean, this is really yeah. good, right? The other way around. But it's the nothing that brings back the uh, splendor. Now, the, I think what's interesting for me here is the way in which you can jump from Wordsworth to mm -hmm. someone like Mother May, yeah. and May Asu. First, mm -hmm. I mean, you know that famous uh, statement about Mother May when he says, you know, I say flower. Yes. And I'm thinking of the flower absent mm -hmm. from all uh, yeah. from all bouquets, right? So absence here is like a lack of relationship, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the thing, yeah. as well. not its position within mm -hmm. a bouquet that defines it, right? So it's yeah. really an attempt to go towards a kind of object center. Uh, and other things, and, and which is no accident, I think, yeah. why Malawi is so important for mm -hmm. Mayor Su. Yeah. Right? I mean, he writes this uh, big book on him. But with, uh, with Mayor Su, I think the way he develops this is to say that the only thing that's necessary, as you would yeah. told us, right, is contingency itself. Right? That the contingent, so it's like this links up to the great Malawi mm -hmm. poem, uh, yeah. to Dead, right? Yeah. Right. So it said contingency. So it's like there's a kind of you know structure where the uh, where poetry becomes a, a kind yeah. of a way of, of approaching. Uh, I have the second set of points, which, um, which has to do with um, uh, Mears' uh, uh, book on what is it called the, the divine the divine in, in existence. Yeah. Right. And uh, the and you remember how it ends, right? With, with this typology. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the, we believe because there is God. You know, if you think of, of yeah. God as object, mm -hmm. right? We believe because this, there is God. So this is theism, right? Or we disbelieve yes. because there is no God. That's atheism. Right? And third position is uh, we uh, uh, we disbelieve because there is God, mm -hmm. which is Luciferianism, yes. right? Or, 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 mm -hmm. or kind of. Uh, Yes. And the, the last position, which I want to say mm -hmm. a little bit about, is when he says, you know, um, uh, we believe because there is no, uh, 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 because God does not exist. Mm -hmm. And he says that this last position, it's a position we have not explored yet. Now, I don't that's think his that's position, true. yeah. I don't think that's true. I mean, you found it, we found it already in Wordsworth. You found it, we found it already in, 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 in Malame. And I mean, uh, if I were to use another kind yeah. of language, uh, that's a kind. I mean, the whole thing is a kind of political theological track. Yeah. Right? And the I think the politics here, uh, uh, you know, in, in that last position, is something which in another in another language we might call a politics of disappointment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might call that, and I call it that. Okay? Yeah. Right? Politics of disappointment that we believe because. Mm -hmm. God does not So it's yeah. very different from the politics of Paul. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, sure. And this sort of gives a, a kind of, maybe a kind of angle on what things are. As you say, you know? Yeah, okay, I mean, no, that's a very, everything you said, I can't really respond to it because you said so much, and, but I mean, I'll, um, I think the link between philosophy and poetry or philosophy and art more generally is obviously important, and I take aesthetics really seriously. Um, so, but I, if you took, look at what these, Philosophers and self I mean, The only place where White ever writes about literature is in a chapter of Science of Modern World where he writes about the Romantics and specifically about Wordsworth and Shelley. 
and he counterposes their, their sensation of nature to the, to the way in which, in effect, 19th century mechanistic science makes a thought of nature possible by being so reductionistic. And he wants to recover this romantic um, thought, thought of nature. Um, and I mean, my, whole, my book's called The Universe of Things, which is a quotation, which is a line from a poem by Shelley, which Whitehead quotes in Science of the Modern World, and which is also the title of a science fiction short story, which I quote in my book. But um, it, it, I think that's, for me, that goes back to the whole question of these two views. What differentiates Whitehead from phenomenologists is he doesn't want to just rescue the phenomenal poetic view from the scientific view. He wants to reach a point which affirms both equally, which neither, which he says neither phenomenologists nor scientists are willing to do. And that involves ultimately an aesthetic valuation of the world. I mean, ultimately for Whitehead, as for Graham Harmon today, and also as for maybe Nietzsche in a very different way in the 19th century, um, aesthetics is first philosophy rather than epistemology or being first philosophy, let's say. Um, but I'd also link that um, to Mallarmé. I mean, there's a, the quote I always take from Mallarmé, which is not quoted by Maya Seward, which is actually, I think it's somewhere in my book, but it's actually the opening, it's the opening sentence of my new book, which is coming out soon, from called, about accelerationism, that's something. But anyway, it's the same with Mallarmé. It's uh, from his essay, La Musique et les Lettres. It's a footnote, and it says, the, my rough translation, the end, everything comes down to aesthetics and political economy. So, I, I, I take aesthetic, I, I actually, in my own way of thinking these, I take both aesthetics and Marxist political economy as being the two primary ways in which we can understand at least the human world and maybe the entire non human world as well. And, and if we took that seriously, we have to rethink romanticism. Completely. Probably, yes. <laughs> I mean, is it more Whitehead's liter? I mean, when the liter Whitehead's own taste seems to be to the 19th century. He liked the romantic poets saying like Dickens, but there's also this connection of Whitehead with modernism because of Whitehead's friendship with Gertrude Stein. Um, and so Whitehead never writes about Gertrude Stein, but Whitehead and Stein spent a lot of time together, and actually in the autobiograph in the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, Stein writes that Alice met only met lots of really brilliant people, but only three geniuses. The three geniuses Alice met were Gertrude herself, of course, Picasso, <coughs> and Whitehead. And there's this kind of interesting connection with, you know, literary modernism through the Stein, Whitehead connection, and their mutual interest in William James. Um, so I mean, there's there's all that that so it's unclear that Whitehead had any appreciation for Stein's writing, but he was personally very friendly with Stein, and there's something going on there. I don't know if that's an answer. That's just another direction. Other questions? Yeah. So along similar lines, I'm interested in Whitehead on God. Yeah. God, in a way, seems to be guaranteed here, both awareness um, and the cause of our awareness mm -hmm. that emerges out of nexus as, yeah. an, as an aggregate. I just spent a super relevant time on Whitehead, but he seems to emerge almost out of the pattern of nexus and then guarantees yeah. this correlation. Mm -hmm. That's one of the um, But I'm curious about why he would use the kind of er term for the cause or the correlativists dream, right, for there to be yeah. this thing of excess that nonetheless has meaning and guarantees human subjectivity. Nevertheless, well, I mean, how do you see it or account for that? What God, for how do we account for God in what it's just, I mean, I don't know. Why I, use God? I what? Why use the term God? It's, 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 it's not in like your Whitehead himself claims that um, he was the first philosopher since Aristotle who posited God out of metaphysical necessity rather than out of a misplaced piety. Um, this may not, this may be an self-idealization. However, Whitehead, I mean, it's very curious because Whitehead talks about God incessantly and, and God seems to play an important role in his system in process and reality. And yet Whitehead is not in any sense, though I think his father was a pastor, an Anglican pastor, but Whitehead is not is in any sense Christian, even though there have been Christians inspired by Whitehead. And, Nobody, I mean, some people have just tried to reread Whitehead without God, which I don't think is possible. Others have tried to, you know, think of Whitehead in theological terms. So the process theology, which is a very interesting stuff, which is centered at the Claremont School of Theology, not too far from here, is, you know, has been upholding for 50 years the Whiteheadian tradition in theology. For me, 
Uh, I think that you, the only way to understand why it's God, and this I haven't done, this is like future work I hope to do, is to think about Spinoza and Leibniz. Whitehead, if you read Preston Reality, Whitehead refers, to, refers incessantly to Locke and Hume. On almost every page he's talking about Locke and Hume. He only refers briefly and in passing to Spinoza and Leibniz, yet he says in those brief things that his philosophy is much closer to Spinoza and Leibniz than to anyone else. So if you think of the role of Spinoza in, and of God in both Spinoza's system and Leibniz's system, and he explicitly criticizes Leibniz's invocation of God, and he doesn't mention Spinoza's God, I think, I think ultimately have to understand why it's God in relation to Spinoza's God and maybe also Leibniz's God. And that's, you know, that's, you know, another 50-minute talk to try to draw out, which I haven't written yet, so I'm not sure what I'd say, but that's something I'm interested in. So that's the best answer I can give, yeah. yeah. I was really struck in your discussion of Harmon and what you were calling Whitehead's test, the two tables of an object. Yeah. And the physical, you know, that immediately calls to mind Plato's famous exposition of, of mimesis, mm -hmm. because there are multiple, you know, yeah. tables as well. And then what you, you know, Harmon passes the test because there is only this type of table that can never really be grasped. Do you see this in a way that there's an attempt to get beyond this, the centrism is kind of ultimately tipping from materialism into idealism at places? It could, I mean, I, I, that's an open question for me. I mean, I kind of think, and, and there's so many different ways of defining idealism, and some people, yeah. you know, use this ultimate curse word, other people, you know, are willing to rehabilitate it. Um, Ian Hamilton Grant, is willing to say that what he's doing is a kind of idealism. But he says idealism just means that believing that ideas are physically real in the same way that volcanoes are physically real. Um, Harmon tries to sidestep the question. He, he says he's not a materialist, and he tries to sidestep those debates by suggest. Harmon suggests both that materialism is reductionist because it's, it, it, it's reducing all kinds of things to materiality, which is Ill conce in an ill-conceived way. Um, so I'm not sure what the answer what, what the answer is. I'd say that if these if these various strains that are succeeding, they're redistributing. So instead of having idealism versus materialism, they they're redistributing. Binary, so. Yes, they're redistributing the terms in a, in a new way, which I'm not sure we've all figured with that Dave or I have figured out yet. But I mean, again, you know, I'm a, I'm a Marxist basically in terms of you know when it comes to the human sphere. So. I'm, I'm susceptible to the tradition which sort of is always suspicious of idealism, though there's also, of course, Lenin saying that he prefers intelligent idealism to stupid materialism. But, you know, I mean, they, I, I think maybe, you know, I mean, there, 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 there are other ways of negotiating this. I'm very interested, for instance, in the analytic philosopher Galen Strossen, who, who, came, who's, who basically advocates for panpsychism, or the idea that mentality is an intrinsic principle of matter. And he says this is the true materialism, rather than, you know, r rather than reducing consciousness to, and saying that it's kind of an illusion. Um, so I mean, again, this, I don't have a simple answer to you because I think you're, uh, it's the tip of an iceberg. But I'm, I'm glad you raised the issue because I think that issue, if you really go through its ramifications, is very much at, at work here. Um, so spec, I mean, speculative reason would resist. Traditional materialism, both in saying that it's not, I mean, either saying that that's a reduction as, as much as any other, which is what Harmon would say, or even in Brassier's terms, saying that um, materialism, the real resist conceptualization, to the materialism is still conceptualizing, it's still falling short of what it's trying to refer to. Yes? Uh, it seems to me that so much of the differentiations between the different theories yeah. hinges on. Um, the relationship to anthropocentrism. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly interested in the relationship of anthropocentrism to the new materialism. Yes. And um, when you talk about performative contradictions, um, I, I wondered, um, you know, uh, there's something like a circle. I think new materialisms were um, trying to get more and more radically mm -hmm. uh, away from anthropocentrism. Yes. That, but then with someone like Jane Bennett, they seem to come full circle again when well, she says, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, we need a little bit of anthropocentrism. No, she says we need anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. I really yeah. think, I, I mean, I actually feel, okay. I, though I didn't really talk about new materialism here, I mean, partly it's because I think they're addressing different issues, though they have many convergences. So um, the speculative realists who are mostly male, who I was talking about, are mostly addressing these epistemological dilemmas which begin with Kant. I think new materialism, where the many women, and this feminist new materialism is very important, is maybe taking it from a different angle. I think, I actually feel closer to Bennett in Vibrant Matter than I do to any of the four speculative realists they talked about. Um, but what Bennett says is that we may, I mean, I th okay, Bennett says there may be worth taking the risk of anthropomorphism to get away from anthropocentrism. And I'll give a gloss on that, which I'm not sure she would endorse, but which seems to me to follow what he's saying, which is, um, it's sort of like, you know, I have a dog, I love my dog, okay, but does my dog love me? Well, in a certain sense, I think he does, but, you know, the dog, my dog, I don't think my dog's feeling of love for me are really the same thing as my feelings of love for my dog. Now, what does that mean? I mean, it's, um, Descartes didn't believe that dogs had souls, which for him meant that dogs were just mechanisms and that, if a dog was yelping in pain, that was no different than a, than a, than a door, you know, which wasn't oiled, creaking on its hinges. Um, very few people today would agree with Descartes. I mean, even in, even in the, even shortly after Descartes, Leibniz said Descartes was ridiculous. Obviously, Leibniz says animals have souls. Um, but I mean, the point is, it seems problematic to me, and here I agree with the new materialist to sort of make such a division between human beings and other entity, other organic entities, maybe other entities, you know, but certainly other living things, to say that we have this, you know, precious thing which nothing else has. And that's, that seems to me to be anthropocentrism. It kind of comes back in some of the speculators. It comes back in Maya Su because Maya Su sees the emergence of human intelligence as this kind of singular event which is completely gratuitous and but that does lead to, I mean, Maya Su thinks the universe is entirely dead mechanistic and unfeeling aside from human beings, basically. And Brassier also, because Brassier buys into Robert Brandon's distinction between sapience and sentience, or Brandon is always disparaging mere sentience and say, because we speak with have language, we're sapient, not just sentient. We can give an act for reasons. And that puts it, I mean, again, that seems to be that we're a little too proud of ourselves and we're making our differences from animals much greater than they are. On the other hand, you don't want to say, I don't want to say that my dog is just like me. I think, and so what this comes down to, and this is where I think my gloss on Bennett is, um, it would be wrong to say only human beings have emotions, so my dog doesn't have any emotions. Whatever kind of animalistic things are going on in his little doggy brain, they aren't really emotions, we should just poo poo them. Um, on the other hand, I think it would be ridiculous to think that my, the do dogs have same, the same emotions that human beings do. I mean, there are different species, there have been a long, intimate relation to us. Dogs are very different from wolves, not so much genetically, but through both genetic changes and habits that have been acquired over thousands of years from their association with us. So dogs are symbiotic with us in a very important way, and therefore their emotions are related to our emotions in ways that, say, the emotions of a totally wild animal wouldn't be. But I think these animals have emotions. They, just, they, they don't have emotions which are quite the same as human emotions. So I wouldn't want to say that my dog's loyal to me or affection for me is the same thing as the way I love my dog. Because, I, because he's had a canine emotions and I have human emotions, you know? And there obviously are differences. I just don't think we should be so proud of the differences that we put ourselves on a higher plane than, every, than everything else. And that's how I take anthropos. It's anthropocentric to think only we have emotions. So it, to say that a dog has emotions might risk being anthropomorphic because, you know, we're not making this radical distinction anymore, but I think, again, we recognize dogs, I think dogs do have emotions, but they aren't necessarily the same as our emotions. That's, what it, that's my answer to that. And that's, I, that's why I think it's important that then it's distinguishing between centrism and morphism. Other questions? Yeah. I was interested, I mean, I, I really appreciated your um, talk. Thanks. Uh, but the thing that, that struck me is that in terms of Weikheim's magnification of nature and the tests that you yeah. sort of outlined with each author, that in Grossier and, um, and Harmon in particular, what sort of bridges or kind of allows for some kind of parity between the two is for Harmon love and for Grossier desire. So I was just curious about how you see those things which we might consider not necessarily you know, solely human affects yeah. to play a role in terms of how they try to 
how love and desire work for, yeah. like, for Whitehead or for? No, for, for Bussier and for Whitehead and how, you know, how you see that. I kind of don't think that desire and love are strong points for either of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Even though they're obviously there. Um, so I, I don't have any, any good answer to that. I mean, I think in my adaptation of mostly Whitehead and Deleuze, I have thoughts about those in other types of contexts, but I'm not sure. I mean, see, Brassier, I mean, Harmon's, I mean, if, you, if we're talking about their political positions, which I think might have more to do with desire and love, I mean, I don't know. Harmon's politics, I don't trust or particularly like Harmon's. I like Harmon, but I don't particularly trust or like his politics. He, his, his recent book on Bruno Latour's politics, I think is a very good book in terms of growing up what's happening in, in Latour, but it has these kinds of anti-leftist cliches, which I would prefer to do without, which I think that contribute to Harmon as well as to Latour. In terms of Brassier, Brassier, my understanding is Brassier is a Marxist, but he's a Marxist in a very weird way because it has a very weird oblique relation to his ontology and epistemology. And I'm not sure I understand Brassier well enough to know how he works that out. Now, I know I'm deterring your question by instead of talking about their theories of desire and love, I'm talking about their, their political stances, but um, that's the only way I can really see to do it. I mean, they aren't concerned with desire in the kind of Freudian or post psychoanalytic sense in the ways that other people are. Picking up on the Brassier in particular, you mentioned that uh, for him, he, he, he can't entirely do away with what you're calling poetic. Yeah, or what he called, I mean, he's calling following selves the manifest image. Okay, uh, because there's a desire. Well, it's like, again, I mean, it's, I'm not sure it's, the, I'm not sure I was speaking rightly if I said that it was because of desire. I think, um, Perhaps here is saying that, I mean, in a certain sense, the manifest image is, is, is what creates the normative, dis, the normative requirement that we discover the truth in a certain sense. I mean, that's sort of how he puts it. I don't find this very convincing myself, but the normative need to discover the truth for Brass here comes from the manifest image, and that's why he says explicitly he's unwilling to go along with Nietzsche and embrace, and embrace like the will to illusion or the will to falsity. Um, so in a certain sense, I mean, Sellers is, I mean, there's, in a lot of recent discussions like of, of philosophy of mind, and especially in the more eliminativist or reductionist versions of it, there's a lot of thing of sort of, you know, um, getting away from anything which would be like a manifest image. I mean, there's people like the church limbs will refer very sneeringly to folk psychology, which is just our common sensible delusions about ourselves. And in reality, we scientifically we know and I think Patricia Churchill even wrote that, you know, in some future more enlightened time, we'll never say I'm in pain, we'll say fiber C733 is being stimulated. And I mean, that seems to me to be ipso facto ridiculous, so, you know, I mean, but that's my Dr. Johnson kicking the rock, you know, at least reaction. Um, but Brassier doesn't quite say something like that because what Brassier's trying to do is to rescue this rationality which has been a humanist project and detach it from, hum from humanism and from the human. So it almost becomes this kind of impersonal kind of drive of some sort. I'm not sure what the drive sort of were either, though it's probably better than more of a desire, rather than being a feature of humanity or of the human or anything like that. Okay. Hope that makes any other questions? Well, thank you all for having me out here and for listening. Thank you.